And welcome to Your Business, Your Wealth. My name is Paul Adams, founder and CEO of Sound Financial Group, and I am so excited to be your host today, especially because this is the day we're rolling out the new podcast name. We're rolling out one of our team members who you guys have not had a chance to meet yet, but we've been talking about. This is going to be a jam-packed session. I can't wait to see what everybody's able to learn from our podcast today. We're also testing out brand new video equipment we've never used before. So God help me in getting through this without fouling something up terrible for the editing team. Uh, today, we're going to talk about The Millionaire Next Door, and you're going to get a chance to meet A Millionaire Next Door today. Today, we have on the show, Mr. Jeff Miller. Jeff Miller, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. So glad to be here. Man, I'm glad you could be here. We've been talking about you coming on the show for quite some time now and never had the trigger quite pulled. And then the first time we have you is literally the day we change it to your business, your wealth, and the first time I'm using this new video equipment. Corey's not even here to supervise. This could be an absolute shooting match today. We'll see how it sorts out, but I'm glad you're here and at least embracing it with us. Uh, Let's just kind of start off, Jeff. I think a lot of people listening, I think, can get two things collapsed. And that is everybody has this desire to want to build wealth, but they collapse building wealth with looking wealthy. I would agree. And it's it's not hard to happen because of how we're marketed to and how we love to compare ourselves to other people. And we minimally want to keep up, if not look like we're doing the best on the block. Yeah, that's right. Uh, not just keeping up, but people love to look like they're ahead. And it's we're wired that way. We've talked about it in past podcasts and some of our past live events that there's like this genetic biological connection that what we want to do is like peacocks with our feathers. We want to shake them and demonstrate our wealth. Mm hmm. And that's something that just didn't exist like for our forefathers because the same assets that they would hold that were the very things that they built wealth with were visible to others, right? If, if Jeff had 10,000 head of cattle, everybody saw them speckled along the hillside. If I owned the saloon in this town and the next town over, you knew, well, he owns a couple of businesses. If Corey owned the newspaper, in three or four towns, like, oh, he's the one that owns the Chronicle. And so all those things had physical properties other people could see, but now it's not that. So what I think I want to do is have you share a little bit about what it was that caused your mindset to be different than most. And, and just to give a little bit of background on Jeff, since you guys have heard me talk about him in the past, uh, Jeff is our vice president of client selection. So he's really a person that has a great mind for looking at somebody's balance sheet, understanding whether or not they're going to get the greatest value for the work that we do for them. So we literally run every new client past Jeff and he's like head of admissions to becoming a client with Sound Financial Group would be the best way to think about it. But Jeff, even though you had a balance sheet strong enough that you never had to work again after age 48, uh, Maybe let's just go all the way back to what it was like early on and what had you doing things with your money that other people just weren't willing to do. Mm. Uh, well, it, it probably starts back, you know, as a, as a little kid and just the types of conversations that I was exposed to uh, within my family, within uh, just the kids that I hung out with, where I went to school, where I grew up. Uh, so I, I had some role models, uh, particularly in one of my grandfathers who started one of his own businesses as a, as a young man uh, when he was in his teens as the, as the head of his household. And so I, I learned a lot from him. I saw that, you know, while they had a lot of financial success, they weren't definitely not um, spreading their peacock feathers. They, mm. they weren't showy individuals at all. Uh, no surprise that they, you know, experienced the great depression. And I mm. think that really modeled a lot of their behaviors and their attitude towards money, some good and, and some, uh, some not so good candidly. 
um, and we hopefully you have a chance to talk about both the, you know the good and the bad of of really trying to save a lot and invest a lot in your future. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that that I experienced was a sense of I developed a lot of my habits and practices more from a sense of scarcity than a sense of like abundance and opportunity. And I know this isn't uh, you know, a therapy session. We don't need to necessarily go that deep as to why, you know, I, I'm happy to, to talk about, you know, those things that, that I experienced, um, you know, in, in my younger life that helped drive some of those behaviors and, and, and practices. But if, if I could, so you, you had mentioned, we were talking just a little bit before recording that one of the things that you, you had done, and this is both the, the kind of maybe the good side and the bad side is that you had developed this, uh, it was almost scarcity, the perspective from which you were saving and you were building assets without kind of clear aims for how much it would take. Just it always felt like it would be more than what you were currently setting, currently setting aside. Well said. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I saved a lot. Didn't know what I was saving for. Didn't mm. know how much I needed to save, but I just, you know, always wanted to, to save as much as possible. Now, don't get me wrong. I like really nice things and whether it's a, it's a car or a vacation or, and you know, other life experiences, like I live a great life right now. And even, even when I was in my, um, the phase of my life where I was saving as much as possible, I still managed to take great vacations, um, enjoy life along the way mm -hmm. for the most part. Well, and what would it be like, you know, you're kind of one of the things that you mentioned is people that are normally our clients we work with that are in that realm of 300,000 to $2 million of income. And you've always said like, everybody should be able to build up enough wealth like you did where you could be done working. When you, you're a member of Sound Financial Group out of desire, not necessity. Mm -hmm. And I think that gets lost for a lot of people. Most everybody listening, this is probably going to work tomorrow or right now while they're listening out of necessity, but you didn't know the destination. You just kind of had the more would be what I need. What do you notice when you look at the people that, you know, we're reviewing some of the balance sheets every day. Some people we make offers to, to become clients, some that we just give triage and send them on their way, hopefully better for having gone through the initial stages of our philosophy. But what do you think you see for most people in their actions, both people that are friends of yours and, or people that you've seen as clients now, the biggest things that they do that are eroding their capacity to get to work optional lifestyle as fast as they could. Mm -hmm. uh, it, a couple of things come to mind right away. Uh, first is not appreciating or even understanding the incredibly long feedback loop that we have with this thing called definite financial independence or a work optional lifestyle or whatever you being able to punch out, whatever you want to call it. Um, the sooner you can start to build those habits and put money away for the acquisition of, of assets and, and wealth building, uh, the better, the better you are. So it's not appreciating the time. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I think, which is huge for all of us is again, the, the constant pressure that we all feel for a variety of reasons to consume mm. and to buy a bigger house or a nicer car or you fill in the blank, whatever it is for you and what, you know, what might be important or even not so important that you get reeled into believing that there's this, whether it's a need or just, a, you know, a right to own something or, or buy something and live a certain lifestyle. So, I, I, so I think it's controlling consumption and thinking that we can start tomorrow as easy as we can today or yesterday. Well, and I'll say one, one thing when you mentioned that controlling consumption, 
And we've talked in past podcasts about cultivating contentment. But one thing that I notice happens for a lot of people is that you have that moment where you say, oh, you know, I I think now is a good time to get in with fill in the stock here. Or I think if I did this one thing here, I could drop my cost of investing in some way. Or if if I could just get the lottery, whatever those things are, all things are wildly out of our control, even the investing side, I'm gonna invest in this friend's business that's hopefully gonna produce a great outcome. And yet any single one of those things don't really get the job done. The one thing that can always get the job done is always within our control, fully within everybody's agency, is how they choose to deploy their capital for consumption. Mm -hmm. And yet, every message we get every day is either pushing us to buy some investment that's supposed to bail us out or to buy some consumable asset that is then going to make our day, make our life, increase our position. And those two things, not only do people lose wealth with this active management and trying to shift where they're aiming all the time and change strategy, but then couple that with that there's just lost capital we're sending to other people's balance sheets. Tesla or Target, it doesn't matter, but it's just flowing off of our balance sheet because people don't have that imbued capacity to just say, oh, that makes my life better, that doesn't. But I think one thing that is a really expensive lifestyle thing, most people listening can't afford is the work optional lifestyle, is financial independence. Now, you'd mentioned when you were building wealth, you didn't, you weren't holding like the 4% rule of, oh, when I get to this many millions, that's enough to pay all my lifestyle and I'm done. I had no idea. I had no idea what number I was shooting for, what number I could comfortably peel off each year. It just was something that I knew I needed to do and needed to always do more of. Wow. And now that's the the funny thing is that without strategy, but control of lifestyle and a high savings rate, you still built financial independence. Now you didn't know you were there. It was like it took you engaging us as a firm, like you needed to hire a guide on that journey to realize like you're actually already at the top of the mountain (laughs) or the mountain you've been trying to climb is right there. Uh, We just need to walk over like 50 feet and you've now made it. It's a little bit like wandering and you know, you, you and I are both backpackers and it'd be a little bit like getting a little ways off the trail and feeling like you're wildly lost. And then you hear somebody on the trail and you just hear the voice and it's like, oh, that's, that's, I mean, I get chills thinking about it because you, you can feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Absolute despair. Like, do I need to activate my spot device so that the cavalry comes to get me? Right. And not realizing the path was so close. Um, in just a minute, I want to come back and talk about how you increased your savings periodically as your income increased. Welcome back to Your Business, Your Wealth. We have with us today, Jeff Miller, meeting the millionaire next door. Jeff, uh, as you went through life, you mentioned that you kind of just kept, you started saving something and then you kept saving your increase every time you made more money. Now, by the way, for all our listeners, the quickest way to getting to literally world-class savings rates is to save a chunk of your increase. Now, you didn't save a chunk of your increase most of the time, did you? <laughs> well, when I was starting out in my career, you know, making $22,500 <laughs> per year, not per month. In what, 89? In July of 1989. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it wasn't, I, I still did save some money. Uh from day one. So you started with the practice of some money is going to get set aside that I'm going to buy assets with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And some of that money back then were uh, US savings bond. There you go. Offered through payroll deduction. In all fairness, in the 1980s, those were paying pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, they weren't bad. They weren't bad. Um, You know, but as my income began to increase and my total earnings improved, um, a lot of times I was on incentive-based compensation, so sales bonuses and and uh, commissions and and things like that. I always looked as looked at as gravy, right? Mm-hmm. If I could live, you know, on my base salary, or even a portion of my base salary, 
then anytime those supplemental, you know, non-budgetable expenses that would come monthly or quarterly or whatever, those always went directly into uh, some type of an investment vehicle. So anytime you got like, so you got your regular pay coming in and then you had some, the incentive comp. So uh, Jeff spent his career in the health insurance industry, both on the corporate side and on the field side of, uh, but all of those had bonuses and or incentive comp built in and you would just sweep that aside. So you lived off your base salary, giving you the capacity that if 50% of your income that year was incentive compensation, you were able to just set all of it in assets. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I really did. And, and as much as I always looked at, you know, the brand new sports car or other objects Mm -hmm. that exemplify wealth, perhaps. Yes. Uh, I controlled myself to not go out and, you know, even though I could write a check for that car, if I wanted to, based on a, on a bonus payment, didn't do it. Yeah. Now, what was it? like just around your friend circle. So you, uh, you grew up and you had friends on similar tracks to you. And, and one thing that I've gotten to know about Jeff, Jeff started working with us, uh, last year about this time, just a little less than a year now, but your friends were not on the same decision track. You were, even though their incomes were pacing similarly. Yes. Um, I, you know, I, saw people that were making a lot more than me and a lot less than me, mm-hmm. but regardless of what they were making, a lot of them might not have embraced really any or much of a view towards the future mm-hmm. and, you know, long-term wealth accumulation and savings. And and so how did you combat the fact that some of them they clearly expanded their lifestyle through their career more than you did? How did you deal with that mentally? Just holding strategy in the midst of people doing everything they were going to do. Uh, I, you know, again, it came, it, it came, or it comes from that feeling of which, which I don't have to the deg- degree that I used to. That feeling of scarcity. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, you know, I, I guess to use some of the the terminology that we talk to our clients about, you know, uh, cultivating contentment. Mm -hmm. I just would be content with a very nice looking, you know, used European car than Mm -hmm. a brand new one. Yep. You know, buy one that's four years, uh, four years off a lease or something and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, maintain it well. Again, I like to, to have nice things. But I never pay retail. <laughs> yes, like I have all kinds of you know all kinds of little ways to sort of hack your way to, uh, you know, financial freedom. Mm-hmm. Just in terms of you know controlling that consumption and and controlling how and where and what you buy and and so. But you did have to live next to friends living a certain way. Like uh, even talking to clients and sharing with them some of our ambitions as a household of living on drastically less than we make. And you know, one I get all the time and, uh, you and your wife don't have kids, but one that I get in having kids, like, how do you, how in the world can you have three kids and pay bills on that amount of your income? Well, it helps to have a nice income. But the second thing is it's like, I think what our listeners can forget about is like, look around the world, look around our country period. The average household income is 45,000. The average household has two kids. Like people figure it out. They make compromises. Some they maybe wish they didn't have to make, but that all we have to do is set a strategy for what lifestyle we're willing to live and be okay that other people making the same amounts of income are going to buy a Tesla, are going to buy the bigger house, are going to buy, go on the bigger, badder vacations. In one thing that's shown up for me, and I, I first got exposed to this concept by uh, a guy who was a mentor of mine for years, a gentleman named Kelly Kidwell, and he he came up with this. I just remember we were having lunch one day, and he brought up this this thing that when you have kids as a dad, you'll see that this dad coaches all the sports, and then you see that this dad 
he is so good at taking care of his wife's concerns. And then this dad is really good at helping kids with homework. And, and the list goes on of all the dads you know and how good they are at different stuff. But in our mind, we don't separate them. We instead ended up with this super dad that just really knows everything. And, and, and unfortunately, that's who we compare ourselves to. And I think social media has done something similar. And maybe I would even contend it may have been much easier for you pre-Facebook, pre-Instagram, because we now it's like, yes, maybe we have one friend that bought a nice car. Then we have another friend that takes amazing vacations. And then we have another friend who has a boat and we have another friend. And we're not really making the distinction that they don't all have all of those things. They're all it, doing one or two of those things, but it's getting collapsed into the superhero, super yes. financial hero that has the great car, you know, owns a share in a jet, takes yeah. the nice vacations, right? Totally. Yeah. And it's it's this like, uh, you know, we our kids will periodically compare. And so we've taught them like if they're, well, so-and-so has X, we say, what's comparison? And the what we've taught them is it's the thief of all joy. But there is this comparison trap that draws our consumption levels higher than we would have chosen if we had been in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, and, and so now it's almost, it's almost more difficult than it's ever been to set a strategy and hold strategy that relates to money, especially in cultivating contentment, which is why we recommend our clients read books like The Millionaire Next Door, read the book, Stop Acting Rich and start living like a real millionaire. In fact, his daughter, Dr. Thomas Stanley, fortunately killed in a car accident, uh, I think it was August of 2015, but his daughter just published another book I've not yet had a chance to read yet that I think should be incredible. But it's this idea that the people that really accumulate wealth don't do the things that everybody else is doing. That in fact, in all likelihood, the person with the bigger, badder house does not have a balance sheet that looks as good as the house. The person with a couple of Teslas in the driveway probably doesn't look as good on their balance sheet as that driveway looks. That does not always, but statistically speaking, it's not mm -hmm. as good. It's not as secure. And here's the thing that actually just for all of you listening that I didn't realize until we got here in recording this podcast, I did not know you did not have a destination that you were grinding away, saving, building you and your wife, both. And she has a great career but you guys were just continuing to store away money without that strategy and destination. And I, I can't say how often when I speak to a group or when I talk to somebody, I say, what is the amount of capital at work that's required for you to be a definite financial independence? They don't know. And it's, they don't know because look around, nobody teaches it. Mm -hmm. All the financial products that are out there, they want you to buy them out of surplus all of the things they market to us that we would consume. They want us to buy out of surplus or create, think about this guys. They want us to create deficit in our own lives. Go take out a loan, which sometimes is totally appropriate, not saying never have a car loan, but just consider that when they loan you money, they're not lending money on the car. Because if they repossess the car and you're upside down for what they can auction it for, guess who they come after? You and your future income. That's all anybody's lending against. And that that's what trips people up. But if you could impart one last nugget for people as they listen, as they try to think about, gosh, could I do that? Could I build up millions of dollars of investments early enough in my life to be able to be okay financially or have a work optional lifestyle? What would you say to them? Start today. Mm -hmm. Just because of the you know, the power of compounding and the time value of money and all the ways to look at that is uh, don't wait till tomorrow and just make some type of a financial commitment to your future self. And it doesn't have to be, you know, 20% of your income right away. We'd like you to get there as soon as you can, because mm -hmm. the sooner and the more you can put away towards wealth building, uh, the quicker you'll get there. And just think about the first dollar that you save. Like one, you're gonna put away $1 a week. What's the easiest way to earn a 100% rate of return on that dollar? 
figure out a way to save a second dollar. Oh. I know you you know you can't do that all the time and it, the math doesn't work for every amount, but just think about quickest way to get a 100% rate of return on a dollar that you saved is save another dollar. And and now we're talking about it in the context of the millionaire next door and the way you built it, but what we would say is now that you would put money toward asset building. You would put money into your wealth coordination account. I should highly encourage you guys just search wealth coordination account anywhere on iTunes. I think we're the only one that uses that term in any podcast in existence. And we've got ah, two or four episodes just specifically on that topic. So you can take that in. I, I've got to tell you, if, if what we could do as a result of this podcast is create a conversation and situation for all of you that we could enable you to break apart from the cultural common sense. If we could put you in the position that you could realize that you can live for the future that you're building for yourself and your family, that you don't have to live in the same future everybody else is. One thing that I would love to leave all of you with today is no longer say to people, I can't afford that. Because the minute you say the word afford, you are on their field of play. You know, your friends say, oh, you make good money. You can definitely do it. You should just just tell them, say, oh, I, we would love to go do that, but it would break strategy for us. But in order to say that, what you have to have is a strategy. So think about the 4% rule. Think about the amount of income you want to have in your work optional lifestyle. And you can do the math. For every $200,000 of income you want to have perpetuated out in the future, you got to have 5 million capital at work. That is a lot of capital to accumulate and can almost seem entirely daunting. If you need professional help, if you want to have a conversation with us about philosophy, we're happy to do it. We're happy to schedule a time to do that. You know how to get a hold of us. But if you can just simply break away from all the marketing, break away from all of the get rich quick investments, and instead put yourself in the position where you and your family decide where you're going to deploy your capital and consumption actively, proactively, and thereby how much money you're going to put into assets and then work with an advisor, you work with us to be as efficient as possible in the way that you deploy those investments. It is not complex, but it ain't easy. And what you can do is you can do something like what Jeff has done, where you can build a balance sheet that gives you the opportunity to have a work optional lifestyle. Jeff, I'm so happy that you could be with us today. And I look forward to having you back on some of these topics that I know all of the founders, all the entrepreneurs, all the business owners that are listening right now have a challenge with. And I think that this one in personal lifestyle consumption may be one of the toughest. Yeah, glad to be here, Paul. So thank, thankful that uh, I've got the opportunity to be a part of the Sound Financial team and participate in <laughs> we got the dog barking in the backyard. It's just perfect. Why don't, why don't we say that? Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. We'll just, they'll, they'll we'll fix just, it. Okay. Paul, thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to being able to participate in future episodes. <laughs> one more time. <laughs> Paul, thanks so much for allowing me the opportunity to participate today. I had a great time and I look forward to being on future episodes. And we look forward to having you also. And thankful to have you here at Sound Financial Group. Everyone today, if you can take away nothing else, what I want you to be able to take away is you don't have to live by everybody else's rules. That you can make different decisions today that allow you to have a different future. And no joke, a bunch of those decisions will, by definition of the likelihood of all the people around you having financial success, you're going to have to make a lot different decisions than everybody else around you. But when you do, on the other side of that, can be a level of freedom, autonomy, and success. All the same reasons you originally wanted to start a business. And that can be present in your life and on your personal balance sheet, as well as your business balance sheet. And what we hope more than anything is that this has been a contribution to you being able to design and build a good life. Mm -hmm.